as we continue our spiraling trajectory down the rabbit hole, I wish you a sturdy spiritual foundation. Today's video is called Man of Steel, Masculinity, Fascism, and Unrestrained Phallic Aggression. The motif of the phallus in film and literature alludes to the multifaceted nature of masculinity. Having both positive and negative attributes, the phallus is associated with fertility and creation, as well as domination and destruction. Today we look at negative aspects of the unrestrained phallus and draw the connection to what is currently referred to as toxic masculinity, which, when looking at it as the will to assert power over others in its most extreme form, becomes fascism. One great example of the mentality of the phallus is from Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, where the phallic drive toward power and dominance is related to the masculine sexual drive. The Nazi salute itself is portrayed as phallic. That the arm itself can be thought of as an extension of the erect phallus puts the Nazi or Roman salute on firm ground as an expression of power and virility. As Dr. Strangelove describes living underground, note that half of him is trying to restrain the phallic urge and self-destructive other half. As he brings up the idea that there would be ten females to each male and that the women would all have to be of a highly stimulating nature, he struggles further to contain his arm from becoming erect. They then later are concerned about the mineshaft space, making sure not to have a mineshaft gap showing that natural tendency of the unrestrained phallus to be larger or more powerful than others. Dr. Strangelove then stands erect, no longer limp in his chair. We also see Major Kong ride the bomb, an extension of his phallus, as he falls. This conveys a sense of the self-destructive suicidal aspects of the unrestrained phallus, showing the Nietzschean idea where the will to power and dominance supersedes the will to life, this is all to say that the masculine will to power via the phallus is somehow psychologically conflated with a sort of orgasmic and explosive self-destruction. Another good example is A Clockwork Orange, where the unrestrained phallus is connected to the psychology of boyhood adolescence. They hurt, they rape, they bully, they unleash their unrestrained phallus upon the world around them with aggression, violence, power, and dominance over others. Portrayals of this kind are rampant. A Negan from The Walking Dead is one other great example of the violence and aggression of the unrestrained phallus. The saviors represent a sort of mini-fascist state where Negan represents the singular alpha male whose bat is his phallic extension, permitting him dominance over others. Another example is Moby Dick, with no shortage of phallic jokes throughout the story. The title is arguably a phallic joke identifying the white whale as a giant phallus with which Captain Ahab sees as a threat to his manhood, emphasized by the fact that the whale emasculated him by taking his leg. Captain Ahab's obsession is an obsession of the unrestrained phallus to reverse the roles of power and reassert his dominance over the whale, i.e. over nature itself. More precisely, the whale represents the untamable aspects of nature, Captain Ahab wants to dominate and penetrate with the phallus, the harpoon, that which cannot be dominated. This inevitably leads to his self-destruction, just as it did Major Kong in Dr. Strangelove. Note that Captain Ahab actually gets entangled by the line of his own harpoon. Attached to the whale, he sinks into the water, finally restrained through the inevitable outcome of his self-annihilation, brought down by his obsessive attachment through the use of his own phallic extension, the harpoon. In Man of Steel, General Zod uses a phallic weapon to reverse the roles from one of submission to one of dominance. Generally speaking, the Kryptonian society is something close to a fascist, authoritarian state, where the individual no longer exists as a free individual, but closer to an insect that serves only the purpose of the colony, bred to have a singular predetermined role. I was bred to be a warrior, Cal trained my entire life to master my senses. Fascism is a nationalistic top-down system with a rigid class structure. The word fascism comes from the Italian term fascio, meaning bundle, in this case a bundle of people. The term goes back to ancient Rome where a bundle of rods with a projecting axe blade called fasces would be carried before a lictor, a superior Roman magistrate, as a symbol of power over life and limb. The stick symbolized punishment by whipping, the axe head execution by beheading. Hence, in Latin, it also meant figuratively 
high office, supreme power. Fasces is the root for fascia, which refers to the thin casing of connecting tissue that surrounds and holds every organ, blood vessel, bone, nerve fiber, and muscle in place. We see here the fascia holding together the muscle fibers, much like the bound bundle of sticks of the fasces. What this essentially conveys is that there is a strength in numbers, bound toward a unified cause. The sticks, the people, the fibers, all working together in unison to assert power and dominance. In my mind, all of this is consistent with that which is typically associated with masculinity and the phallus. And interestingly, there is a similar-sounding Latin word, fascinus, though apparently from what I've researched is not etymologically related to the fasces. However, fascinus is the Roman deity who represented sacred, masculine, generative power, and whose symbol was a phallus. Fascinus also refers to the embodiment of the divine, often winged, erect phallic effigy or amulet used to enchant or bewitch the evil eye. Sort of like a lightning rod redirecting evil energy to the obscenity of the rod itself. The word fascinating actually comes from the word fascinus due to the aforementioned bewitching and enchanting effect it had on the evil eye. To me it seems natural, therefore, to draw the connection between the fasces and the fascinus, as both have a similar-sounding Latin prefix, both represent symbols of masculine power, both were used by Romans, but it was difficult to find direct sources that actually relate the two, so for purposes of this video, I will just treat them as related. Fascism can, in some sense, be regarded as a manifestation of the extreme, unrestrained phallus where unity is created through the masculine generative power of outward strength and dominance. The purpose of this digression into these various words and their similarities is to establish that they all have something to do with extreme masculinity or virility. Yale professor of Italian studies Barbara Spackman said that virility is not simply one of many fascist qualities, but rather the cult of youth, of duty, of sacrifice, and heroic virtues, of stamina, of obedience and authority, and of physical strength and sexual potency that characterize fascism are all inflections of the master term, virility. In other words, the idea of virile masculine dominance and power is deeply connected to the fascist worldview, a toxic masculinity taken to its inevitable extreme as a sort of nightmarish system of supremacy, ultimately fueled by a boyhood libido and preoccupation with the erect, unrestrained phallus. As mentioned, one major aspect of Krypton is that they control their people by forcing roles upon them to benefit their society. I exist only to protect Krypton. That is the sole purpose for which I was born. Another major aspect is that they, without restraint, have extracted energy from their core, subjecting their world to collapse. This expression of power and dominance over their people and their planet is reflective of the masculine extreme to subdue, conquer, control, dictate, which when untamed leads to collapse. We see potential symbols of the fascia in the land and structures around them, a kind of bundle of muscle fibers indicating physical strength, and yet, strangely, the foundation below these structures is barely visible, ripe for collapse. Compare this visual to the phallic citadel, which sits in firm foundation where the ground is clear and visible. Jarell, of course, is more connected to the contrasting ideas of faith and hope. This reflects the same kind of unrestrained extraction of oil during the oil rig sequence. The phallic oil rig essentially reflects the mentality of the unrestrained power and greed without regard for sustainability or stability which again leads to collapse. In Clark's class, we see potential symbols of the fasces, the bundle of sticks in the form of a bundle of pencils, indicating a strict uniformity, likely in reference to the strict and almost fascistic style of teaching conveyed in this scene. We see the masculine energy conveyed by a female teacher showing that it need not only be men that adopt the masculine stance. Note how the teacher is overall very aggressive and towers over Clark. She bangs on the chalkboard with her phallus, the chalk. She bangs on the door as well. This is the world of the intellect, facts, complexity, aggression, and a profound lack of sensitivity and compassion 
and thus we are dealing with elements of that which typically is regarded as masculine, the rational mind of force. We see this more acutely by juxtaposing the teacher's actions with Martha's. Martha uses the power of the feminine to come at Clark not from above, but from below. Martha is sensitive to Clark and specifically does not use physical aggression, but guides him out and works more on the faith that he will make the right choice, which he does, but it had to be his choice. She allows him to be free, whereas the teacher wanted to dominate and control and force Clark out against his will. We see another expression of phallic aggression in the form of direct bullying from Pete Ross, who again towers over Clark juxtaposed by the feminine Lana Lang, who sits on Clark's level and tries to help restrain Pete Ross. When the phallic aggression reaches its peak, we see collapse. We can see the similarities between this scene and the bar scene. Phallic aggression by Ludlow is confronted by Clark. Interestingly, Clark initially positions himself as over and above Ludlow, so he himself uses force and aggression which only spirals things out of control when Ludlow reacts by trying to, in turn, assert his dominance over Clark. Ludlow pours beer over Clark, his arm conveying a sort of phallic dominance over him. The feminine again tries to subdue the masculine phallic battle, but in the end, Clark gets reeled back in and asserts his dominance by destroying Ludlow's fascia. The bundle of sticks, or lumber in this case, i.e. the symbol of Ludlow's power and dominance. As we move into the next shot, we see that a similar truck reasserts its dominance over Clark by simply not stopping for him. Dr. Emil Hamilton from DARPA, you're early. We we're expecting you tomorrow. Which is why I showed up today. So if we're done measuring dicks, can you have your people show me what you found? Lois Lane, of course, calls the phallic posturing precisely for what it is. Colonel Hardy wants to stand above Lois and so refuses to shake her hand, whereas Emile Hamilton, a scientist, greets her as an equal. The duality represented by the military mind and the scientific mind reflects the duality of Zod and Jor-El. The military mind is one that seeks dominance by power and aggression. We see the military's natural response to use their phallic weaponry as the tool to reassert their dominance over the towering Superman when he first reveals himself. We see another bully interaction when Clark is pushed down. This bully very clearly shows extreme masculine aggression. This conveys how toxic masculinity is actually a sign of psychological or spiritual immaturity. Whether it be a bully in school to a fascist use of power to dominate the world around you, it is simply a dangerous immaturity. We note that Clark, in contrast, restrains himself. Pete Ross, rather than trying to assert dominance over Clark, helps him up as an equal. The phallus is, of course, not all bad. Used properly, it allows for the experience of freedom from constraints. We see when Superman fights in Smallville, he is being restrained. It is the unleashing of his divine masculine energy via heat vision that allows himself to be freed. After the battle, it was the restraint Superman showed with the military despite them being aggressive toward him. He chose not to respond, and a new positive relationship formed from that restraint. Superman made the right choice to use both masculine energy of force and dominance and feminine energy of restraint and faith when the situation called for it. He was able to balance between both modes of action. When Superman and Zod fight, we see Zod swing his phallus toward Superman. Superman responds in kind, which reflects Lois Lane's description. We see the negative aspects of the unrestrained phallus when Zod first uses his heat vision, we see in this process the foundation literally crumbling below Superman. Finally, Superman again uses the power of restraint by restraining Zod's destructive phallus directed toward the trapped family. The hyper-masculine childish rage is balanced by Superman's mature expression of restraint, in this case, restraining Zod. We can continue into BVS as well. The kryptonite spear, even those sword of Alexander are all expressions of the unrestrained phallus. We see concretely how the phallus is associated with the mentality to dominate through force. They taught me the world only makes sense if you force it to. Directly followed by Batman picking up the spear that then extends towards Superman. To force the world to make sense with the phallus is used earlier by the CIA during the Africa sequence, 
The use of drones and Hellfire missiles is reflective of the phallic drive toward annihilation and ultimately, self-annihilation. Here we see the CIA carelessly assert its power over a relatively powerless group, ready and willing to decimate the entire area, guilty and innocent alike. The joystick in hand, the phallic object, pushes to orgasmic annihilation, much like Major Kong in Dr. Strangelove. We note the juxtaposition between the unrestrained phallus used by the CIA drone strike with the corresponding restrained phallus used by Batman when he saves Martha. Alfred says commencing drone mode, in ironic contrast to the CIA's use of drones, Batman merely uses it to drop himself off, coming from below rather than the top-down approach of the CIA. Here Batman is shown essentially as the master of two worlds, like Superman, able to balance and use the power from the above and the below. Torture programs, spying programs, drone strikes in recent times are examples of the unrestrained phallus to dominate and control with a forceful hand, a masculine tendency toward domination, aggression, war, and the failure of society to implement restraints in the form of legitimate means of accountability. Recently, under Joe Biden, Chocolate, chocolate chip. Oh, yeah. The so-called lesser evil. 100% of casualties were innocent, seven children and three adults. The drone strike came after a suicide bomb attack by ISIS-K that resulted in the deaths of 13 U.S. service members and dozens of Afghans near Kabul's airport. The three adults were thought to be loading explosives, but instead they were loading water and they themselves were met with fire. The knee-jerk reaction was a reaction of the unrestrained phallus to force the world to make sense, to reassert dominance, but all at the expense of innocent people and children. Hurt or embarrassed by U.S. casualties, a blow to their phallus, the U.S. continues to respond nervously, foolishly, and without restraint. I wanted to ask you about Sunday's drone strike. Uh, can you take us back to that morning? You have intel that ISIS-K is plotting another attack. The military spots a vehicle that you believe is uh, full of carrying explo explosives, uh, and we take the car out with a drone strike, and reports now say that we may have, uh, that 10 civilians, as many as 10 civilians may have been, may have been killed. Um, because of the urgent threat environment at the time, do preliminary assessments indicate that we may have rushed, relaxed, or waived altogether some of the normal checks and balances that we do before a strike like that? Uh, a couple of things. One is, as we always do on all of these things, we initiate an investigation. We're reviewing all the, the video and all that. Uh, but having said that, you know, what do we know, what do we don't know, what do we think sort of thing? Uh, at the at the time, and I think this is still valid, uh, we had very good intelligence uh, that ISIS-K was preparing uh, a specific type vehicle uh, at a specific type location. Uh, we monitored that through various means, um, and um, all of the engagement criteria were being met. We went through the same level of rigor that we've done for years, uh, and we took a strike. Uh, so that we did. Secondly, um, is we know that there were secondary explosions. Uh, because there were secondary explosions, there's a reasonable uh, conclusion to be made that there was explosives in that vehicle. The third thing is we know from a variety of other means that at least one of those people that were killed was a ISIS facilitator. Uh, so were there others killed? Yes, there are others killed. Who they are, we don't know. Uh, we'll try to sort through all that. Uh, but we believe that the procedures at this point, I don't want to influence the outcome of an investigation, um, but at this point we think that the procedures were correctly followed and it was a righteous strike. This is the boyhood immaturity carried on into the highest military generals, as mirrored in Dr. Strangelove. We would therefore prevail and suffer only modest and acceptable civilian casualties from the remaining force, which would be badly damaged and uncoordinated. As well as the bullying and fascism expressed through Zod and Man of Steel. Every action I take, no matter how violent or how cruel, is for the greater good of my people. The unilateralism reflected by Batman and BVS. Jesus, Alfred, count the dead. Thousands of people. 
What's next? Billions. He has the power to wipe out the entire human race, and if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. And we have to destroy him. But he is not our enemy. And further expressed in the authoritarian domination of villains like Steppenwolf and Darkseid. I have turned 100,000 worlds to dust looking for anti-life, looking for those who robbed me of my glory. I will stride across their bones and bask in the glow of anti-life, and all of existence shall be mine. It's toxic. That's good. They're a primitive species, unevolved and at war with one another, too separate to be one. Their free will must be ripped from them. Who wish to strip people of their individual freedoms and free will. Who seek to dominate and rape the earth of its resources. Whose solution for every problem is merely a bigger, unrestrained phallus. Not fundamentally different than the mentality of the schoolyard bully, but brought to an extreme. The world hangs on a thin thread, and that is the psyche of man. And when that thread snaps, it will take the psyche of supermen and women to support it.